my pleasure to reintroduce today's speaker, um, Milana Bessina. Um, so Milana, you heard many of his accomplishments yesterday from Mike, I will repeat just a few of them. Um, he's currently a distinguished professor of mathematics at the University of Utah. Uh, he received his PhD in 1984 from the University of Tennessee, and then was at UCLA between 85 and 93 before he went to Utah. Um, he gave an invited address at the ICM in Beijing in 2002, and will be giving a plenary address at this year's ICM. Um, and I'm especially proud to call him my future colleague. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Thank you, Rachel. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, speaking of ICM, uh, I'm reminded that 40 years ago, Gromov, who is considered to be the father of the subject, geometric group theory, he gave a, a talk at the ICM, and his basic message was, so Grandma told us, uh, view groups as metric spaces. Okay, so, so my talk today, or at least the you know, first half or something, uh, is going to be to try to explain what this means. Okay, so um, all groups today are going to be finitely generated. Okay, so you have a, a finitely generated group, and you're going to fix a finite generating set. So let's say A, this is like A1 through AN, this is a generating set. And for convenience, we'll assume that this is closed under taking inverses, so A equals A inverse. And given this, we can define kind of a norm on the group. Right? We take uh, G and G, and we define the norm. This is all with respect to this A here. Um, th so this is just going to be the minimum K so that, um, so that G can be written as a product of K elements of A. So this is A, A, A1, dot, 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 A, I, K. OK, and uh, because A is closed under taking inverses, uh, we, we see that the, the norm of G is the same thing as the norm of G inverse. And this gives rise to a distance function that's uh, invariant under left translation. So you define the, the word distance or the word metric, the word metric on G. Uh, this is going to be, so the distance between uh, two elements, say G and H. So I want this to be invariant under left translation. So I can, if I multiply by G inverse, Right, I'll get the distance between one and G inverse H. So that should just be the norm of G inverse H. Okay. So this is the this is left invariant metric. The group is acting on itself by left translations, and it, it's an isom. You know, every left translation is an isometry with respect to this metric. Okay. Now the question is, what happens if you, if I pick a different generating set? So if if B is another. So maybe I'll put D sub A here temporarily, because it depends, this distance depends on A. Uh, if B is another finite generating set, set then, then I have two different metrics. And I can look at the identity map from, you know, from one metric to the other. And it's pretty easy to see that this metric, this uh, map here is by Lipschitz. It's, a, it's, only, it's only a bijection, but it's by Lipschitz, right? I can, I can uh, represent each of these AIs in terms of the, the B generators, and the longest one has length 15 or something. Well, then this map is going to be 15 Lipschitz, and likewise going the other way. Okay. Um, now it turns out that so so you could you might guess that what we are we are going to be looking at groups uh, with with metrics but modulo the spy Lipschitz equivalence but in fact the official definition is slightly weaker so we 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 really look at uh, a notion of quasi isometry so um, so that's something that's weaker than a spy Lipschitz equivalence so let me define it so x and y are going to be metric spaces. And I'm, I'm not going to bother naming the distances. Um, so f, a function from x to y, is a qi isometry. Uh, quasi, no, just the qi. Quasi isometry, that's what this means. Quasi isometry. Uh, 
if you can find constants uh, k l, so k here is going to be greater than equal to 1, l is going to be greater than equal to 0. Uh, so the two things hold. So one is uh, the first property is sort of a weakening of, of being Lipschitz or by Lipschitz. So the first thing is uh, that for every uh, two points, x1 and x2 in x, if I look at the, so I want to estimate the distance, this is now distance in y between the images of x1 and x2. Okay? Well, this should be bounded above by this constant k times the distance from x1 to x2. If I stop here, this will be exactly the Lipschitz condition, but I'm relaxing it and I'm adding this L. So the, the, the gist of this is that when, um, when x1 and x2 are close to each other, you know, when the distance between x1 and x2 is small compared to L, then this term L dominates. And, and then you don't really, you know, the, the only inequality you have is that the, the, the distance between the images of x1 and x2 is not too large. It's bounded by this L. But it could be that you have x1 and x2 are close to each other and they're mapped to distance L. Okay, so that's, that's, um, that's not the Lipschitz behavior. You know, two, two points arbitrarily close to each other might get mapped to distance L. But large scale, right? If you, if you view this from a large distance where L looks small, then, then this, this condition t tells you that the map is sort of coarsely Lipschitz. That's the, the, you, people use the word coarsely to indicate that it's, you know, that there are these constants, bounded constants that you don't, um, that you sort of ignore. Okay, and then there's also a lower bound like this. So if, so it's one over k, the distance from x1 to x2. If I stop here, that would be exactly the by Lipschitz condition, but then here you're allowed to subtract L. So for when, uh, when the distance between x1 and x2 is small, this is likely to be a negative number. And then there is no lower bound at all. So points that are not too far from each other are allowed to get mapped even to the same point. But if they're very far apart, if the distance between them is large compared to the cell, then the cell is you know, kind of negligible. And then you, you kind of see the, this by Lipschitz condition. OK, so that's, that's one condition. Uh, now, if I stop here, then, then you, you could get something like some kind of embedding. You, know, you don't know that you're covering the whole target. Yeah, I want some condition that says that the map is onto, coarsely. So, so what does that mean? It means that um, for every, say, y and y, there exists x and x, so that the distance from x, so from f of x to y is less than or equal to L. Okay? So every point in the target is within some bounded distance of the image. Okay? So that's what, um, that's what a quasi-isometry is. And we, we, we are not going to, this, if you have two metric spaces that are quasi-isometric, we'll regard them as being the same. They're equivalent. Okay? Uh, there is maybe a, a better way to, to think about quasi-isometries. Um, so the, the relation of, relation of QI is generated by, so there are two operations that you're allowed to perform. One is, uh, one is that you, you have a you know, by Lipschitz equivalence, uh, just like for groups over there. By Lipschitz, by Lipschitz equivalence. And the second one is uh, what, what distinguishes this concept from uh, by Lipschitz equivalence is Namely, uh, co-bounded inclusions. So here I just mean you have a, a metric space X that sits inside a, a sub, uh, as a subset of a metric space Y. And it, it just satisfies. So if you, if you restrict the metric from Y to X, you get the metric on X. So it's, a, it's an isometric inclusion. But in addition, uh, this inclusion is you know, L-dense. Let's say, let's say we call this property L-dense. Okay, so this L dense, coarsely dense. So I'm, I'm allowed to replace a big metric space by a smaller subset as long as that subset is coarsely dense. So what are some examples here? Well, like uh, say Z in R, right? So Z and R, you know, this is a co-bounded inclusion here. And so Z and R are quasi-asymmetric to each other. Notice that the, this doesn't have to be a, a continuous map. So if you want, um, if you want you know, quasi-asymmetries to have inverses, 
then you can construct one, but it's not going to be continuous from, from R to Z. For example, the uh, largest integer is sort of the inverse quasi isometry to inclusion. Uh, another example is finite index subgroups. If I take, if H, uh, so H and G are finitely generated groups, and this is a finite index in there, uh, then, um, then this finite index subgroup is going to be coarsely dense in G, and uh, the, the H and G are going to be quasi asymmetric to each other. It's an equivalence relation, yeah. So two, two, two met, yeah, metric spaces. Of course, it's not a set. The, the set of metric spaces is not a set, but there are some issues. But anyway, it is, uh, it is transitive, right? Symmetric and transitive. Okay. Um, okay, then maybe I should also give you the, uh, you know, the statement that, that's considered to be the fundamental theorem of geometric group theory, if you like. It was proved independently by Milner and Schwartz before, this was long before Gromov. Um, and the statement is just that if you have a, okay, so the Milner, so, um, so G is a group acting on on X, X is a metric space, and it's a geodesic metric space. So I'll tell, tell you what that means. Geodesic metric space. Um, the action is proper and co-compact. Geodesic means that any two points are connected by a path whose length is equal to the distance between the two points. Okay, so like the Euclidean plane or hyperbolic plane or, or a graph where every edge has length one. Those are all examples of, um, well, connected graph, I should say. Those are all examples of geodesic metric spaces. And, and today, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'll have any, any spaces that are not geodesic, but there's certainly, we tend to think about all this, about geodesic metric spaces. Okay, so uh, suppose you have this situation, then, um, then first of all, G is finitely generated. And if you, maybe if you recall, uh, if you were here yesterday, this, this kind of fact came up when we were proving that some group is finitely generated. It was acting co-compactly and freely on some level set, and that's really a special case of this theorem that is finitely generated. Um, and the orbit map, right? You take some um, point, you fix some base point in X, so you send G to uh, G X naught, where X naught is some base point, this is a, is a, is a QI. It's a quasi isometry between G and X. Okay. So an, an example of this is you know, Z is acting on R in, in this fashion here. So Z and R are, Z and R are quasi isometric to each other. Or if you have a, let's say you have a co-compact lattice in some uh, semi-simple Lie group, then it's going to act in in this fashion on, on the symmetric space. And so this lattice is quasi asymmetric to the symmetric space. So if G is a SL2Z, X is the up half plane, which is also a uh, example? That, that action, SL3Z, you said, that, that action is not co compact. So there are some, there are some issues when, uh, so you, I mean, this is even true for SL2Z. SL2Z is acting on a hyperbolic plane, mm -hmm. but not co compactly. And SL2Z is not quasi asymmetric to the hyperbolic plane. Um, right. Okay, so, uh, so maybe to, to expand on, on Gromov, Gromov's dictum here, uh, let me say um, the following. So, so Gromov really said the following. So first study a large scale invariance of groups and metric spaces. And this, this really means, uh, this uh, large scale really means those properties that are invariant under quasi isometries. Okay? And then the second one is uh, classify 
groups up to quasi assemblies. Now that's that's of course just a dream. You're not going to. This is like classify all manifolds up to homeomorphism. You're never going to do this. But uh, in, in 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 some classes of groups, maybe you can. And and in fact, uh, the, the the there's a very successful series of of theorems about rigidity, quasi-asymmetric rigidity. Okay, so here's, here, I'll just give you a couple of examples of uh, quasi-asymmetric rigidity theorems. So that's, um, that's a special case of the rigidity theorems. So one is, this was, this was actually proved by Stallings in the 60s, way before Gromov. So this, as usual in, in these subjects, right, people do stuff before it's officially you know, born, the subject is <laughs> officially born. So this, so Stallings didn't say it this way, but this quickly follows from what Stallings proved, namely that if, um, if you have a group Q, a G say, and it's quasi-isometric to a free group, Fn, and, and then is at least two, so it's a non-abelian, it's not Z, it's a non-abelian free group, then, um, then G is, um, G contains, a free group, a free subgroup of finite index. We also say virtually free. Okay, so, so G is virtually free. So clearly, if you take a, if you have a group that contains a free subgroup of finite index, then it's going to be quasi-asymmetric to this free subgroup. Um, also, it's it's also pretty clear that all free groups, all non-abelian free groups, are quasi-asymmetric to each other. Right? Like F three occurs as an index 2 subgroup of F2, and so on. So they're all, they're all commensurable in this way. They're, they um, appear as finite index subgroups in each other. So, um, so this is kind of the best theorem you can have. So that, that's, that's rigidity, right? Any, it, it, you know, the, the, the goal is to say, well, if a group is as quasi-asymmetric to a given group, then it's one of the obvious groups that are quasi-asymmetric to that. There's, no, there's nothing else. Another example of this is uh, free, free abelian groups, and this follows from a deep theorem of Gramov himself, um, his famous polynomial growth theorem. But let me just state the, this corollary, which is um, that if uh, if G is quasi-asymmetric to Z to the n, then G is. Now I'll use this word virtually. Z to the end. So this is somehow, um, uh, you know, I find this quite amazing that the sort of large scale geometry can, can re re you know, it can recover the algebra of the group. You know, it can reconstruct the group up to some very small ambiguity. Um, I think that's very remarkable. So there are many other examples, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't really want to start listing things. Uh, maybe I'll just mention that you know in this in this Gromov theorem, the main uh, large scale invariant that plays the role is the growth of the group. So you look at the ball of radius r and look at how many points in the group there are in this ball of radius r. It's a function of r, and um, he, he proved that if this function is dominated by a polynomial in r, then the group is virtually nilpotent. Okay, and then you have to work a little more to to actually get this statement. But it, it follows pretty quickly. Um, there are other uh, there are other large scale invariants that I won't talk about, but let me just mention uh, one that's important in geometric group theory, namely uh, isoparametric inequalities. I mean, if I take a, some kind of a loop in in the space, um, um, then then you want to know you want to know what the, what's the smallest area disk that this loop bounds, and this leads to the you know, isoparametric functions. And that turns out to be uh, another quasi asymmetric invariant of, uh, of metric spaces. Okay. Um, or say being finitely presented. That's also a quasi asymmetric. So if you, have a, if you have a group that's finitely presented and it's quasi asymmetric to another group, this other group is also finitely presented. So there are certain finiteness properties there, large scale invariants. Okay. Um, today, I want to focus on on one uh, large scale invariant. Uh, 
Uh, so today I will talk about asymptotic dimension. This was also introduced by Gromov, and it's a it's a large scale invariant, large scale um, analog of the usual covering dimension in topology. Okay, so let me just give a definition. Let's start with the definition. So you have a so x is a metric space, and I want to define the concept of asymptotic dimension of x being less than or equal than some integer n. And then, of course, the dimension is n if it's less than or equal to n, but not less than or equal to n minus 1. And it could be infinite if, if none of these things hold for any other. OK, so what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, for every r, so this should remind you for, of uh, you know, the, if, if, if you're familiar with the, the covering dimension topology, so then there's something like for every epsilon, right, there is a cover with some properties. But here, it's, this is supposed to be a large number. So you're going the other way. Instead of, instead of arbitrary a small number, here, this is, here, what's relevant is that r is a large number. So for every arbitrary large number r, there exists a uniformly bounded cover of x. So in other words, elements, so let's call it, uh, let's call it u equals u alpha. Okay? These are some subsets of x. And uniformly bounded just means that uh, these, so soup of the diameter of u alpha over all alpha is finite. And there are uniformly bounded sets. Uh, so that every R ball, no matter where its center is in, in X, intersects at most, at most n plus 1 of these sets of u alphas. OK? So this is somehow, you know, except for this uh, uh, change of, you know, if you replace r by epsilon and you insist that the, the bound here is epsilon, then, then you'd get the topological dimension. Well, you'd have to also insist on u alphas being open. Here, here u alphas don't have to be open. You can easily make them open if you, if you like so. If you like to have them, they don't have to be open. Um, OK, so maybe to, just to, to give a, a simple example of this, let's, uh, let's look at the plane. So you play the plane, so x is r2. OK, and I, I, want, to, I want to establish that the asymptotic dimension of, of r2 is less than or equal to 2, which is what you might expect. Um, so I need, I need a cover of the plane by uniformly bounded sets. So you know, if you look at, if you open any dimension theory book, you might be you know, likely to see this picture it, with the only difference that um, these sets, so this is called the brick decomposition for obvious reasons. Right, so here's, here are the bricks. And uh, you know, in, in the usual dimension theory, the bricks are supposed to be very small. But for us, they're going to be very large. And so that you know, if, I, if I take, a, if I take a, a ball of radius r, Right? It'll look like something like this. Here's a ball of radius r. And it will intersect at most three of these sets. You can move it around, but you'll never intersect four. OK, so that's what, so, so we established this, this uh, inequality here. In fact, uh, the asymptotic dimension is equal to two. Uh, but maybe that takes a little more work. You, know, you have to, this is like in dimension theory. How do you prove that the covering dimension of the plane is not one? So it takes a little bit of algebraic topology. I mean, you, 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 you have, whenever you have a cover like this, then there's going to be a map to the nerve of the cover. And, the nerve, and, and, and then there's also a, a map back from the nerve into the, into the plane. And the, <coughs> this composition is, will be bondedly close to the identity. So, um, so the fundamental class will factor through the nerve. So the nerve can't be one dimensional, because it doesn't have a non-zero two-dimensional class. So that, that sort of proves that, that you can't have, that the asymptotic dimension is equal to two, not just, uh, not just less than equal to two. And, and similarly uh, for Rn, Rn has asymptotic dimension n. <coughs> Are there any questions? OK, let me. Uh, Yeah, 
Yeah, so, well, yeah, yeah. so in, in the, okay, there are some slight, I mean, you, can, you could define it that way. You could say, absolutely, you know, the, the delta both. But yeah, so you, in the usual de the definition, the purple is just the point. But these sets, the bricks have to be open sets. So module is some thickening or something. It's the, st the same picture, except it's small. Okay. Um, so then, then there are these theorems about uh, asymptotic dimension. Some of them are pretty clear. Some are, you know, require some work. Uh, so, for example, but they're all motivated by the usual dimension theorem. So, for example, asymptotic dimension of, of x cross y, right, is less than or equal to asymptotic dimension of x plus asymptotic dimension of y. And this is exactly the same theorem in, in, in dimension theory. If you have a, let's say, let's just imagine compact metrizable spaces that we don't, we don't get into trouble. But um, So this is certainly a theorem. If you, you remove a and s, then, then you get a theorem about compact metrizable spaces. Uh, so this is called the product theorem. Uh, there is monotonicity. If y is a subspace of x, then asymptotic dimension of y is less than or equal to asymptotic dimension of x. That should also be pretty clear. Um, it's it's qi invariant. So if x is qi to y, then they have the same asymptotic dimension. In fact, this, there's something called coarse equivalence, which is even weaker than QI equivalence. It just, you just have to know that the map from you know, one to the other sends uniformly bounded sets to uniformly bounded sets, and, and the same for the inverse. But um, anyway, we, we won't need that. We'll just think about quasi Um So, for example, uh, so example. So, if here's the first example of a of a space that has infinite asymptotic dimension. Namely, L2, Hilbert space. So asymptotic dimension of L2 is infinite. Why? Well, because it contains Rn for every n. So by monotonicity, monotonicity, the dimension has to be infinite. Um, there also, so, so for groups, for groups, you can uh, then define asymptotic dimension of a, of a finitely generated group by taking a, a word metric. And then, and then we know it doesn't depend on the choice of the word metric. So if G is a finitely generated group, then, then we have a, so we, take, we define asymptotic dimension of G to be the asymptotic dimension of G with respect to the word metric. So if you do this, then, then you also see some, um, I mean, there, there, so for example, z to the n will have asymptotic dimension n because it's quasi asymmetric to Rn. Um, okay, so for example, these, these groups are not quite, you know, to different ends, they're not quasi asymmetric to each other. Um, there are groups, there are finitely presented groups that have infinite asymptotic dimension. Um, so there is a Thompson's group that Rachel likes to think about. So uh, I don't know. So I don't know, asymptotic dimension of. So that's a certain finitely presented group. Uh, and it contains, it contains e to the n for every n. So then it's mentioned as being infinite. Um, so, so, I mean, one, one, one philosophy here is that, you know, you, you're trying to understand the large scale geometry of something and, and you, you could, you, uh, you know, the, you, I, in, the philosophy is that you, you can't claim to understand it if you don't even know if its dimension is finite or infinite. It's like, you know, here, here's a space and you don't even know if it's, you know, what this dimension is or if it's finite or infinite. You can't claim that you understand the space, right? It's the same thing with groups and asymptotic dimension. But there's also uh, uh, another motivation, maybe more, uh, more important than this, of, of you know, studying asymptotic dimension. And it's, it's a theorem of U, uh, namely that if, if G has a finite classifying space, 
finite VG, that's a classic in space. And if the asymptotic dimension of G is finite, then, um, then the Novikov conjecture holds for G. So this is a conjecture about, uh, about manifold topology, and it, it kind of predicts, if you have a manifold whose fundamental group is G, it predicts where the contracting classes can, can sit in, in the cohomology. Um, so it's, it's very important for the classification of higher dimensional manifolds. But anyway, you don't, you don't really have to worry. I, I think, I mean, intrinsically, it seems like this is an important thing to, to look at, even, even without the use of it. OK, and there's one more theorem that, that's important here. And then we'll, uh, then I want to show you, I want to show you, um, I, I, I'd like to prove something every day. So I want to give a proof of a theorem of ground. Not, not the big theorem, but you know, something, something he proved. Um, yeah, one more property here, four. So this is called the Hurevich theorem, and, and this was, <coughs> For as I mentioned, this was proved by uh, Bell and Bernishnikov. So it's the Bell and Bernishnikov Korean theorem. So the, the, the classical version, the Korevich version, is for uh, co the covering dimension, and it goes like this. If you have a if you have a, a map between compact neutralizable spaces, so here I'll, I'll put it over here. So f from x to y, this is a uh, map between compact metrizable spaces. spaces. And um, the dimension of every point inverse is less than or equal to n for every y in y. Then, um, then the dimension of x is less than or equal to the dimension of y plus n. Okay. So you, don't, you can't increase the dimension of, of x by more than n uh, if, you, if you insist on all fibers being at less than or equal to n dimension. And this is the, the exact analog in, in the asymptotic dimension setting. So it's, it says the following. So here we, 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 have, a, a, we have a Lipschitz map instead of a, instead of a continuous map, so f from x to y is Lipschitz. Lipschitz. What do you spell Lipschitz? There's an I in there. OK, so it's a Lipschitz map. And you assume, so it's not, it's not enough to assume the point inverses uh, have uh, asymptotic dimensional less than equal to n. You have to, you have to think coarsely. So instead of a point, you're going to take a bounded set. Okay, so for every, for every r greater than zero, greater than equal to zero, if you look at the collection of point inverses of balls of um, radius r centered at points in y, so b, y, r, so I take the pre-image of a ball centered at y, and they look at that family. Okay, so that's a that's a collection of metric spaces, like a collection of fibers. Um, so has asymptotic dimension uh, less than or equal to n uniformly. Okay, so I, I don't really want to write this out. Th this is more than one space. It's a family of spaces. So I, this is requiring a little more than, than the, that, that every, every space by itself has asymptotic dimension less than or equal to n. You, you know, in the definition of asymptotic dimension, you're supposed to come up with uni this uniformly bounded cover. There's some uh, bound on the diameter of the sets, given r. Well, here, that, that bound has to apply to all of these spaces. That same bound has to apply to all these spaces at once. Okay, that's what uniformly means. It's not just uh, that it's bounded cover in each of these spaces separately. But that whole thing has to be bounded uniformly by some number. OK, I won't write that up. No. OK, so it's sort of a technical condition that's usually satisfied pretty uh, clearly if you have some kind of group action around. OK, then, then um, asymptotic dimension of x is less than or equal to asymptotic dimension of y plus n. 
and, and an example of this is if you have a short exact sequence of groups. So one goes to A. So this is like having some kind of a vibration. Um, and you want to, so all these groups are finitely generated, say. If you have a short exact sequence of finitely generated groups, and, and you, you think about this map F from B to C. This will satisfy th these kinds of assumptions. So the, this uniformity will come from the fact that, that uh, you know, B is acting on, on itself and it's acting on, on you know, C. And so any, any kind of a ball uh, can be translated around. And so the, these point inverses are all asymmetric to each other. So they all, they all have the same, um, the same bound for these covers. So then um, asymptotic dimension of B is less than or equal than asymptotic dimension of A plus asymptotic dimension of C. You know, these, these point inverses here are sort of thickenings of A. They're, they're bounded thickenings. They're all quasi-asymmetric to A itself. So they will have the same um, asymptotic dimension as A. And so that this is just going to follow from the theory. OK, so that's one way in which you can figure out something about asymptotic dimension when you have these sort of, sort of sequences. Um, OK. Um, let's see. So I guess I want to, I want to now um, talk about Gromov's theorem about asymptotic dimension. And this is really an excuse to introduce hyperbolic groups. That's a very important class of groups uh, in geometric group theory. So Gromov's theorem every hyperbolic group has um, finite asymptotic dimension. So this is a class of groups that we think we understand. I mean, it, this is all, of course, you have to take this with many grains of salt. We don't really, don't, we, don't, we can't really answer all the questions. But we kind of feel comfortable in this, in this class. And whenever we have a group that we try to, try to understand, and we, we have, a, say, an asymmetric action on something hyperbolic, then we're happy. In, in fact, uh, the, the latest trend in geometric group theory is to under, try to understand non-hyperbolic groups, like mapping class groups, for example, um, by, by their actions on, on hyperbolic spaces. OK, so, so let me explain now what, what hyperbolic groups are. OK, so definition. So this is, uh, Gromov attributes this definition to rips. And then Gromov had some you know, alternative definitions of the same concept. Um, but it goes like this. So, uh, uh, say a geodesic metric space, metric space is delta hyperbolic. So here, you know, as opposed to calculus, you're supposed to think of delta as being very large. And delta is not small. It's Gromov's delta. If um, every geodesic triangle um, let's say so here is your three vertices a b and c and then I have I have the triangle so every triangle is thin is delta thin so um, satisfies Well, so let's say the, the side BC is contained in the delta neighborhood of the side uh, AB union BC, union AC. Every side is contained in the delta neighborhood of the union of the other two sides. So you, you, you walk around from, from B to C, you, you follow the geodesic, and, and you walk. so you're, you're always within delta of one of the two sides. So first you're kind of close to this side, and at some point you switch, to, and you're, you're close to the other one. And this delta does not depend on the time. Okay? So for example, in Euclidean plane, Euclidean plane would not satisfy this, because you'd have larger and larger triangles where you, this delta would have to be larger and larger. But delta doesn't depend. It just depends on the space, not on which triangle you picked. OK, now it, it also turns out that these triangles are thin in a very controlled way. 
you can uh, you can look at there, there are these three points on each side that you know you, you think of inscribing a circle here. So there are three points where the circle touches the sides. So this is these are characterized by saying that there you know th this distance here is the same as this the distance here, and then these two are the same, and these 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 two are the same. So there are three magic points that you can find like this. And then you can connect up points that, that have the, the same distance to, the, to that vertex. So for example, here I can, I can draw these the sort of rungs. You can draw the rungs like this. All these rungs are at, 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 of length at most two delta. So they, they, they somehow, the word is fellow travel, right? So you have a, if you have a, a traveler here and a traveler here and, and they walk towards C, well, they're, you know, they're never far apart from each other. They're within two delta of each other. So they, all these rungs are less than equal to two delta. Okay, so that's not part of the definition. That, that's, that can be proved. Um, okay, so in other words, these triangles can be approximated by tripods. Or more generally, the, the geometry here is, is kind of like the geometry of a tree. A tree, of course, is an extreme uh, example of a hyperbolic space where delta is zero. Every, triangle in a tree is completely is degenerate. This delta is going to be taken to be zero. It's just a tripod. Um, okay. The, being hyperbolic is another large scale invariant. So it turns out that that if I have two, so in fact, if x and y are quasi-isometric and x is hyperbolic, and then y is hyperbolic. Okay, so for example, the Euclidean plane and the hyperbolic plane are not quasi-asymmetric to each other because the hyperbolic plane is hyperbolic. That's why it's called a hyperbolic plane. It's a, it, it, the triangles look like this in the hyperbolic plane. In the Euclidean plane, they don't. Even though they both have the same asymptotic dimension, namely two. Uh, so, okay, so being hyperbolic is a... So, so what are some other uh, examples of hyperbolic groups? Well, three groups. Three groups, uh, by the milner schwartz theorem, they're quasi-asymmetric to trees because they act on, 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 their, on, the, on the tree in the usual way. And trees are hyperbolic. Um, so any, any um, so a fundamental group of a hyperbolic surface, let's say a you know, so genus has to be at least two, because again, by milner schwartz uh, the, you know, the, this, the fundamental group is going to act on the universal cover, which is hyperbolic plane, and they're quasi-asymmetric. Uh, or you can take any co-compact lattice in the rank one Lie group. Those are also going to be hyperbolic. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, okay. So now I'd like to, I'd like to give a, a proof of Gromov's theorem. I was hoping to get to a mapping class group, but some of these talks are always they're going much slower than planned. Uh, but OK. Let's so um, OK, this is very elementary. This is not uh, the hardest to grow theorems, that's for sure. But I think it's, it's a good one to, to give here so that we get comfortable with the notion of hyperbolicity. Okay, so I want to, I want to prove that every hyperbolic group has finite asymptotic dimension. So I'm going to look at the, the, the group itself. So here's the, the identity. And I can make a Cayley graph. I should have mentioned Cayley graph in the beginning here. But you, so a Cayley graph is, is right, you take, you take a group with that metric, and uh, it's only a discrete set. But then you put an edge between G and you know, G times a generator, AI. Um, so this, this will define the Cayley graph. So ver the vertex set of the Cayley graph is, is the group itself. And then you, when, whenever you write multiply by a generator, you put an edge between the two elements. So for a free group, right, you would have, you would just get the Cayley graph would be a tree. Um, and then for, for other groups, you would have little, uh, you know, there would be little circles, some little cycles. Um, okay, so now, now we are looking at the Cayley graph of a free group, of a, sorry, of a hyperbolic group. And what we want to do is we want to prove that the asymptotic dimension is finite. So you give me some R, right? And I have to produce this cover. And I, I can assume that R is, is big, as big as I like, because if I find a cover for big R, then this will work for any smaller R. 
So I can, I, I'm going to assume that r is much larger than delta, and, and it's an integer. Okay, and then, and then I want to look at uh, spheres uh, centered at the identity of radius um, a, you know, multiple of 5r. So this is going to be 5r, and 5r, and then there's going to be 10r, 15r. So let's say this is, uh, let me just do my, yeah, I guess I need three of them, three consecutive ones. <coughs> So I'm going to, instead of calling this 5r, I'm just going to call it 5k minus 1r, and then this is 5kr, and this is 5k plus 1r. Okay, so there, there are these concentric spheres going all the way to infinity, but we're going to focus on, on three consecutive ones. And now I want to define the set, uh, or this cover. So given the vertex on this smallest sphere, here is the vertex V, I want to define a set that corresponds to this. And this is going to be some kind of a box um, between the, you know, the next two spheres. So this is going to be C sub V. Okay, so I want to define what C sub V is. Well, C sub V is going to be the set of uh, elements G so that the norm of G is in this interval between uh, 5kr and 5k plus 1r. Five k plus 1r. So that um, so that you can you have a, a geodesic, you have a geodesic between G and the identity that passes through V. So geodesics may not be unique. In the tree, they're unique. But in general, hyperbolic groups, you'll have cycles. And maybe there are two ways of going around the cycle. Um, so geodesics are not unique. But I just want to know that there exists a geodesic, which I will just denote 1G, uh, that passes through V. Okay? So I just look at all such Gs. And then. I want to know what happens if I, so I have another one somewhere. So let's say there is a, there is you know, CW over here. Um, that's a different one. And it corresponds to some vertex W over here. And I want to know what happens if I have a ball of radius R that intersects both of these. Right, so here's my ball of, of radius R. This is an R ball. How can it be that an R ball intersects two of these boxes? Okay, well, um, so what happens is that I can then take uh, I can take one of these you know white points. You know, it intersects the white box. There is a white point, and there is an orange point inside the um, the, the orange box, and I can draw this triangle that I have. So there is a white point, and there is a oops, there is an orange point. And this distance between them, there is a geodesic between them. The distance is less than or equal to 2r, right? Because, because they both lie in this ball of radius r. And there is one over here. And I can draw these geodesics I have to 1. And they pass through v and w. So there is a v over here somewhere. And there is w over here. OK, now I told you about those magic three points. Well, the magic three points are going to be above V and W because V and W are pretty far from this. Uh, you know, you, you, you have, there, is a, there is a whole you know, 5R here distance. And that's much bigger than you know, a few deltas. So, so these magic points, you know, once you get to these magic points, then you're within two delta of this other side. But here, you're, you're far away from it. So it must be that V and W are below the magic points. So in other words, the distance between them, the distance between these two points is less than or equal than two delta. That's what this picture shows, right? So this is how you use the thinness of the triangle. And that's going to say that asymptotic dimension, so the conclusion here is the asymptotic dimension of, of this group G is less than or equal. Now I'm going to write down the, the you know, so it's two times the number of points in the ball uh, down about one of radius two delta and then minus one. Right, so I could, I could fix one of these points like V and I can look at all the other points and they all have to be within 2 delta of, of, of V. So, uh, so, this, so the bound of, on the number of these boxes is going to be you know, however many points I can have in this ball of radius 2 delta around 1. 
Now, why do I need two here? Well, because I could have drawn this purple ball to intersect two of these annular regions. And so you know, the number of things you intersect is twice what you thought. But then, and, and then, then you get this inequality. But in any case, this is some finite number. It doesn't, you know, this didn't depend on, you know, um, on, on, you know, which, on, it didn't depend on K or you know, anything. This is all you, you know, uniform value. Uh, you know, if, if somebody, if somebody just hands you uh, the tree, uh, so a tree, it tells you, well, prove that asymptotic dimension is one. And then this actually follows from this, right? Because delta is zero for a tree. And then this number is one. There's only one point in the ball of radius zero. Um, so it gives two minus one, this is one. So the measure of three is one. But if you try to fiddle and you know, you're listening to a boring talk and you try to prove this for, for a tree, then you get stuck because you think of these boxes as always being connected. In the case of a tree, they're not connected. And somehow, th this is important. You can't, you can't find a cover, uh, as in the definition of asymptotic dimension, where all the sets are connected. That's what makes it somewhat uh, non trivial to prove that. OK. Um, all right, so this was Gramov's theorem. Now, um, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly running out of time, but maybe, uh, maybe I'm just going to say what, um, what I was planning on doing and maybe say a couple of words. Um, so I, I was planning on talking about mapping class groups. This is my, one of my favorite classes of groups to think about. And um, and maybe I was going to talk about this theorem that, that I proved with uh, Ken Bromberg and Fo Koji Fujiwara. Let me just state it. So, um, every, so. Um, so mapping class groups. Have finite. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so first of all, what is a mapping class group? And then maybe I'll just I'll define what the main space is, the, 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 the place are all here. Um, it's all about spaces. That's what we like to do. We like to think about particular spaces. So there is going to be a space called the curve complex that's associated with the surface. And it's a fascinating object. Um, okay, so first of all, so S is going to be, say, an orientable, uh, let's say for simplicity, closed, it, it, you can allow punctures or something, closed surface. Okay, so just imagine something like this. And then the, the mapping class group, or the modular group, technical modular group, this is going to be, you take all homeomorphisms, they're orientation preserving, this plus means preserving orientation. This is not so important there. If you, if you take orientation reversing, they're just a slightly bigger index to group of S. And then you divide by isotopy, or equivalently homotopy. So isotopic homeomorphisms give you the, the same element in there. So this, this uh, the, 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 the subgroup of the homeomorphism group consisting of homeomorphisms isotopic to the identity is exactly the component of the identity. So you're really looking at the group of components of uh, the homeomorphism group. And um, this is a nice group. It's a discrete group. And it's not only finitely generated, finitely presented, but it has all kinds of finiteness properties. Um, and uh, so, so I don't know. What, uh, for example, uh, for the, for the two-sphere, right, this is a trivial group. Every orientation-preserving homeomorphism of the sphere is isotopic to the identity. For the torus, uh, you, get, um, you get SL2Z. Um, you know, for any, you, you can imagine taking the, you know, to, a matrix in SL2Z, and that's going to induce an isomorphism from Z2 to Z2. And then, uh, and also from R2 to R2, and then therefore of the quotient of R2 mod Z2, which is a torus. And that's in fact an isomorphism of groups. Um, 
So it's, it's actually more interesting, you know, what happens when, when these surfaces are larger, you know, hyperbolic. When surfaces have genus at least two, then, then, uh, then there are some greater mysteries about these groups. Okay. Um, yeah, so let me just define the curve graph and just tell you what the important things about the curve graph are. And then I'll, I guess I'll stop. Um, or a curve complex. Okay, so the curve graph of S. Okay, so the, the vertices are just isotopic classes of um, simple closed curves, which are not no homotopic. So people say essential. Right, so I don't want I don't want a little silly circle like this that bounds a disk. They have to be of this type. And then edges correspond to disjointness. If you can, uh, disjointness. If you can uh, isotope two curves so that they're disjoint from each other, then you put an edge there. And uh, th this is kind of hard to, to draw because this graph is, is locally infinite. You can see that, uh, you know, if I, take, if I take a curve like this, well, there will be infinitely many curves I can draw in this half of the surface. Uh, you know, and all of these are going to be joined by an edge to this curve. So, be, so every vertex will have infinite balance. Uh, there's one picture we can draw. If the, if the, if the surface is a torus, then, uh, then, well, in fact, in that case, there are no edges, right? According to this definition, there are no edges because any two curves that are um, disjoint are going to be parallel. And so therefore isotopic. However, for the torus, you have to make uh, a change in the definition. Since there are no disjoint curves, you, you put an edge if the intersection number is 1. So that's the minimal possible intersection between two curves that are not isotopic. And then you get, then you get the, the well-known fairy graph. So for, for the torus, so, uh, so the curve, oops, I picked the wrong chalk. Um, so if S is T2 and you change the definition where edge means um, intersection number one, right, then, uh, then, then the graph is, you know, you, 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 it, this is the graph, right? You have this uh, fairy graph that you, you start drawing and you can't stop. This is the, the uh, right, so the, 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 the curves in the torus are naturally parameterized by rational numbers union infinity. And then you have these edges whenever the little determinant is plus or minus one. And that's the curve graph. And now a little exercise here is that this is, this is um, QI to a tree. Okay? The fairy graph is quasi-isometric to a tree. So it, in particular, it's hyperbolic. And there is a, there's a big theorem here uh, due to Mazur and Minsky. And this somehow, this theorem change the, the way we think about stuff. Um, he told us that you know, there are groups that are not hyperbolic, and they still have very interesting actions on hyperbolic things. They proved that all curve graphs are hyperbolic. <clears throat> They're not all uh, quasi-asymmetric to trees. When you start taking uh, you know, larger surfaces, then they're only hyperbolic. They're not quasi asymmetric trees. But this one is. And then the final, the final ingredient here um, for this theorem is the fact that these curve graphs have finite asymptotic dimensions. This was proven by Bell and Fujibara. Uh, so, uh, uh, the the uh, asymptotic dimension of any curve graph is fine. And, and this, this proof mimics uh, Gromov's proof for hyperbolic groups, 
Uh, the, the only, the place where it doesn't work is because, because these balls of radius 2 delta have infinite many points. So if you just follow Gramov's proof, you'll be proving that asymptotic measure is less than or equal to infinity, which doesn't buy you anything. However, there is a notion of special, of tight geodesics. And if you use tight geodesics, is you know, the definition of those sets CV, uh, they have uh, finiteness properties that, that allow you to actually carry out this proof. So the proof really mimics Gramov's. Okay, and uh, I'll do maybe one more sentence that I can say about our theorem is that we somehow put together curve curve complexes or curve graphs of subsurfaces of the, of the big surface into one big space, which then is hyperbolic. And we argue that it's finite, uh, it's asymptotic dimension of that big space is finite by this Hurevich theorem. And on the other hand, uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, the mapping class that we're going to act on this big map, big uh, hyperbolic space, and the orbit maps are going to be quasi-asymptotic embeddings. And so somehow you, you stick the mapping class group into this big hyperbolic space that's built from curve complexes, which is finite dimensional. And therefore, mapping class groups are also finite dimensional. OK, so I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. It's monotone, right? If you take a subset, you get small. Is there a chance for quasi-isometric invariant, which is a real value or maybe a dense value in the real? So. Um, I mean, you can, I don't know, you can talk about, uh, you can talk about uh, like isoparametric inequalities. And they can be, isoparametric inequalities can be, uh, uh, very, you know, well, a lot of groups have say quadratic isoparametric inequality, like z, z to the n. But there are also groups that have funny uh, isoparametric inequalities, cubic, or, or where the exponent is not an integer, or, or something like that. Uh, that doesn't exactly answer your question, because you know, the, most groups will have exponential um, isoparametric inequality. But you can certainly come up with examples of groups where the exponents are a dense subset in, well, not in one infinity, but maybe in two infinity or something. <laughs> Size of that purple ball. So, so the, I'm check is of the purple ball there. The radius R. Yeah, we said it was like two times. The asymptotic dimension is not like the size of the ninety-one. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because so, so, so we want to know how many of those boxes the purple ball intersects. So we pick we pick V to be uh, you know the, the one that's associated to one of the boxes that intersects. Now all the others all the others are going to be a distance less than or equal to two delta of V. So I can't have more boxes than, than whatever the number of ball, uh, vertices in the ball radius to delta on B is. But that's the same as, you know, we can translate to one. All, all balls of the same radius have the same number of points. And then I have to multiply by two because I could be intersecting the next ring. Right? Yeah? So how different is uh, asymptotic dimension? I know it's different. So it's completely unrelated because you can take, uh, for instance, you take z, right? Z has topological dimension zero, but asymptotic dimension one, right? You can, you can take. Mean, is that what you mean? Uh, k by one. Oh, k by one. Okay, okay. So if the, right, if the if the if if the space if the group has um, cl finite classifying space, then it turns out uh, the dimension, the cohomological dimension is a lower bound to the asymptotic dimension. But it, we, don't, we don't actually know examples where they're not equal. We suspect that the mapping class groups are kind of an example, that, they, that the virtual cohomological dimension is strictly less than asymptotic dimension. But we don't know how to bound uh, asymptotic dimension from below other than using some kind of a homology class or something. And so we don't, we don't know how to do this. But we strongly suspect that the asymptotic dimension is uh, it's a quadratic number, a quadratic function of the genus, 
Well, the cohomological momentum is linear in different genes. Okay. So you don't have any examples of the No. 